why does she continue to do it? Well, out of duty. I think Liz has a great sense of duty to our nation, of service to our nation. Go back three weeks. Did you personally support all the measures in the mini budget? And have you had a Damascene conversion in the interim? Yeah, look, I, it would be completely disingenuous to claim that on that morning when the cabinet was presented with the mini budget, um, that there was anybody sat around the table who said that it was a, a bad idea. Uh, each and every one of the measures within it were coherent with uh, a desire to drive growth. Um, I think what the cabinet failed collectively to recognize is that it was an awful lot of measures being unleashed simultaneously on unsuspecting markets uh, and the reaction from the markets is clear and the Prime Minister has had to make the decision to row back on uh, almost all of those things, although it's important to note, Stig, that the national insurance uh, cut, the stamp duty cut and the huge intervention on energy bills is still very much in place. But on everything else, the Prime Minister has had to row back and accept that the international economic situation is not really... Um, uh, in a place where intervention like that would be possible. I mean, the person who wasn't at the cabinet table with you was Rishi Sunak, of course, who did say all of these things were going to happen. He said Liz Truss made no secret of her desires in this area. Uh, and he said this will cause all sorts of problems with the markets. It will ramp inflation. It will ramp interest rates. It will be a problem. So it wasn't it wasn't completely unpredictable, was it? Well, I mean, I, I just I, I push back gently on the idea that the rise in interest rates, for example, is solely the consequence of the mini budget. I don't dispute for a second that the mini budget had uh, an impact on UK interest rates. It made it a bad situation also... worse, perhaps. Well, uh, yeah, Stig, I, I think that that's, that's a fair analysis. And I think that that's the analysis that the PM made in her interview with the BBC last night and for which she's apologised. So the Prime Minister has a set of fundamental beliefs. She espoused them in a public leadership campaign. You supported her for that because she was very clear about them. She put them into immediate practice and they are now being torn up and repudiated utterly in front of her. And I guess the question for you, uh, James Heap, you understand how leadership works. You're an honourable guy. You come on this programme. You always try and answer honestly. How can any leader whose entire basis for leadership is being torn up in front of her face, how can that leader retain any confidence of anybody and stay in power? Well, why does she continue to do it? Well, out of duty. I think Liz has a great sense of duty to our nation, of service to our nation. And I, I do just reflect it that when I think I last did one of these morning broadcast rounds, it was during the summer towards the back end of the uh, of the leadership contest. And the challenge from broadcasters on behalf of the nation very legitimately was, where's the government? There aren't decisions being made. There is an intervention needed over energy prices that's causing the public huge concern. And since the budget, we have seen what the cost to our economy is of political instability and insecurity and how the markets react to that. So I don't see how, if we've just had a leadership election that arguably went on for too long and caused legitimately you to challenge over where the government was, and we've just seen that the cost of political instability on the markets is enormous, I don't see how the answer to all of that is let's have another leadership election. What you need is a prime minister who reckons that for good or bad, she has been appointed to make the decisions. Of course, this isn't the way she would have wanted her first five or six weeks in government to have gone, but she has reacted to events as they have unfolded. She has owned the decision that she made. She's apologized for it. And she is right now sat in number 10, looking at a global economic picture and a global security picture that requires stability at the top of the UK government. And I believe she has what's needed to now get on with making the big decisions that are needed to be made in order to keep our country safe and our economy protected from some pretty challenging global economic conditions. Um, Jeremy Hunt has said everything's on the table when it comes to spending. Do you accept, James Heapy, that defence spending 
should not be increased to 3% of GDP in these circumstances. Is it okay to say we're going to stick at 2%? No. I mean, we have to get to 3% by 2030, which is what the Prime Minister has committed to. Uh, and in She's fairness, committed to a lot of things in Bavasta. I mean, well, I, everything I, I, is on the it, table, says Jeremy Hunt, and that's going to be but, billions and billions of defence spending is on the Steve, table, surely. Steve, in fairness, the Chancellor and the Secretary of State, Ben Wallace, have had some initial conversations in which I think everybody is clear that 3% by the end of the decade is necessary given the security situation that we are in. And it's not just in the Euro-Atlantic where our security is threatened. We've seen in the last year a war in Europe that we thought was really unlikely when we did the integrated review of foreign security and defence policy only two and a half years ago, and yet now it's happening. But also the increasing uh, increase in tensions between the US and China, um, that's the competition that will define this century. And that's the competition that needs to drive us to invest in our armed forces and our defence spending. So I don't think that anything has changed in that regard. And could you be because... part of a government, James Heapy, that did, did change their mind? If they said, no, no, we're going to affect the 3% is no longer on the table, we're not going to go for it for 2030, would you have to leave government then? Stig, you know that I'm not going to answer the hypothetical, but I have been absolutely unequivocal with you in this conversation yeah. that 3% by 2030 is what is needed to keep our nation safe. And I would also make the point that, frankly, if we are not able to keep ourselves safe and if we are not able to protect the UK interest around the world, our country as a whole will be a whole lot worse off because you cannot have prosperity without security.